Welcome back, everybody. I'm Justin Flinner, and we are here again with Ask the Expert interview with Mina Larson, part two. And we're going to talk today about the exam process, the certification process, and give you some real questions that came from students as well as some acupuncturists via a survey that we performed. So, Mina, I'm really glad to be back here with you again for part two. Thank so, you, Justin. Thank you for having me here. You're all set? Yes, I am. Thank you. The first question, I'm going to go right into this, everybody. So the first one is about the exam and the certification process. Mm -hmm. So once we get certified after the uh, after graduating and whatnot, mm -hmm. we have to go through and take these tests. Yes. And they're different based on the states. They're different based on uh, the state requirements. They're different based on the topic. So can you just tell a little bit about the tests themselves for the students uh, who are preparing for exams? So Absolutely. what exists and what do they have to do? Right. First of all, um, I want to explain about the, the format of our NCCN examination system. Um, the formats are modular examinations, um, so there are a set of exams that um, basically are um, created for, for, t for testing entry-level competence. So we have well, one module that's um, acupuncture for point location, the second module is Chinese herbology, uh, then there's one for foundations of oral medicine, and then um, Biomedicine, which is what we call our safety um, um, uh, exam, it has components of um, practice management, ethics. So, um, in order for one to be certified, NCSIM certified in acupuncture, you have to have taken um, the three of those exams, which is the acupuncture point location, the foundations, and the biomedicine. Um, and then for the oriental medicine certification, you have to take the three exams plus the Chinese herbology. Um, in terms of how that translates for licensure, um, NCCM exams are required, one of the requirements for licensure, it's important that students and applicants know that um, just because you take the exam doesn't just make sure, doesn't mean that you're gonna go ahead and get licensed right away. There, it's a prerequisite. Um, we always recommend that um, applicants contact the states um, and we have a wonderful list of all of the states if yeah, you go so to our website. Yes, one, yes, yes, we have a map it's an interactive map that shows all of the different states and has the contact information, the requirements. Some states, like our state here in Virginia, um, requires um, uh, the certification that you have to take the three exams and maintain your certification. Washington, D.C. Like, uh, requires um, all, uh, the three exams plus herbs if you want to practice herbs. So they're all different. Florida requires that you have to take the herbal exam in addition to the other three exams. Yeah, so they're all different. These other yes. states are a little bit different. For example, mm -hmm. here in the D.C. metropolitan yes. area, mm -hmm. I started in D.C. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are in D.C., you'll know that you really only need two certifications, right. which doesn't really right. give you the full board certification. Right. So people are still staying board certified right. because they're taking an exam. Right. But Maryland, obviously, there is no more. Right. You don't need to take any to get your license. In Virginia, it's right. stricter. You need all three. Right. So Well, the, I have good news in D.C. Um, uh, I'm really excited about the, uh, the, the Washington, um, uh, D.C. Uh, acupuncture um, societies work very hard with the Board of Medicine in D.C. to require, they're going to actually require the three exams. And they're also going to go ahead and require herbs if you're practicing. So they're changing. Now, does that mean right. people who are already uh, have their license have to go back and no. finish number three? No, they don't. And, and, and what really matters is that that's a whole process that we call grandfathering. Typically, when a state adds requirements, like for example, Florida, when they added their requirement for the herbal exam, they don't go back and make people that are already existing licensees to take it. Um, there's been a few instances that that's happened. I remember one time when New Jersey added their herbal component. Um, or or um, they had some people go back and take exams. Um, biomedicine has been added, and, and that's happened on a few occasions. But typically, the norm is when a state adds requirements for NCSIM exams, um, they, they don't go back and, and, and retro, uh, or retroactivate people to go back and take the exam. I also want to explain this, Justin. It's very important that everyone knows that NCCOM doesn't go and, and, and uh, push and, and have an agenda on requiring these um, states to, to adopt it. Basically what happened, like for example, Florida. Florida wanted to um, um, add the herbal component of it. So they contacted us and said, can we work together? Can you give us information about the Chinese herbal module? Can you give us information about the, the, uh, the uh, biomedicine module? So I went ahead and testified mm -hmm. that the Florida Acupuncture Board provided it, and then the board, the regulatory board added it. Um, same thing in Washington, D.C., the Board of Medicine added it. Some people think that NCCM is really going through and pushing yeah. that. So and, yes. it's the boards mm -hmm. that will approach you, yes. the medical boards, yes. and they will mm -hmm. say, we're, 
interested in having this to yes. say our mm -hmm. list of professions in right. our state, right. and they want to get information from right. you. Right. And also, I mean, some of these boards are, uh, well, I should say some of the students or acupuncturists may assume that the NCCM is approaching them and saying, could you do this because it's maybe a great money making scheme, there's a political agenda. This is not the case. It's strictly, it's they want to make the profession right. reliable, strong, uh, and a strong presence right. with the it's the future. Exactly. Thank you for, for stating that. I want to emphasize the NCCOM has a partnership with regulatory boards. We have a partnership for looking out for the safety of the public. That's what we do. Our mission is to is to, is to safeguard against you know um, those practitioners who don't have the education training or they have violations. We're there to protect them. So that's our exactly. mission. Our mission is that, right. and so is the, the regulatory board. So um, some of these boards realize that, and, and some of the associations along with them realize that, look, we want to actually be recognized um, for, for practicing work. We want to have that or, uh, uh, herbal uh, background. We want to have that exam there so that we, we don't have practitioners who don't have the qualifications practicing herbs or practicing acupuncture. So they want the NCC exams there. One of my jobs with our staff is to really support that. So um, for example, this whole issue of dry needling, um, I do a lot of work on that by providing information to, uh, regarding the quality of education and assessments that we have, and uh, what we have compared to someone who's a physical therapist or someone who is a um, uh, chiropractor. So that's, that's why NCCM standards are so important. Um, a lot of people also want to know, like, um, you know, why, why does my state have to require NCCM? Well, that reciprocity enables you to be able to go and practice in different states. So I think I have a lot of questions that sure. have come from people, and sure. I think I'm going to jump a little bit to possibly one of those, which is in relation to uh, uh, the difference between the state borders and why, say, someone in Maryland doesn't mm -hmm. have to take the test, but mm -hmm. people who want to practice in Virginia have to go through the process. So mm -hmm. that may leave the states a little bit behind in terms of being able to offer some really great professionals, acupuncturists. Mm -hmm. However, I mean, it does set a standard. And like we talked about in our previous interview, part one, we talked about building trust, mm -hmm. building rapport with the patients, with the public, yes. to ensure that we are providing to their standards, and not just their standards, but of course the Board of Medicine for that specific state. So practicing in a different state where there is no board certification required doesn't mean that the practitioner is any less or any better, or any worse or any better. Well, let me emphasize the importance of um, national board certification um, because we are dealing with healthcare. We're dealing with acupuncture, which is an invasive medicine. We're dealing with us working in hospitals, working in the VA, working in um, you know um, very integrative settings where we want to get the respect that we deserve. We want to showcase our training. Um, so national board certification is an important part of that. That is why employers, a lot of employers, require that right now. The VA, as you know, requires the certification, right. as well as um, um, you know, cruise ships. If you want to go work on a cruise ship, the majority of them require certifications because that's the gold standard that um, um, insurance companies and others want to rely on. So I really encourage um, uh, those that are NCC board certified and students that want to look into certification to to achieve that and to probably display that. Certification is an important process. When you look at Western medicine and board certification, it's an important deal to show the certification and maintain that. It's the same here with our medicine. So I often encourage our diplomates, please display your credentials, be proud of them. Um, you know, other practitioners in Western medicine or allied healthcare look at that and, and they, they immediately distinguish and respect that. So we know that NCCOM is not necessarily approaching the boards of medicine across the country, but. but I assume that it is somewhat important to ensure that all of the states have a certain level of expectation in terms of their practitioners. Yes. So it doesn't mean it has to come through the NCCOM, but this being the most prominent organization, yes. ensuring that, uh, I would assume from an acupuncture standpoint, myself and only my own practice, that I would want to refer to somebody, say, in Maryland or another state mm -hmm. where they don't require it, but they are board certified. Right, absolutely. And in Maryland, um, I think the, the regulation is that you could either be board certified or you could have graduated um, from um, an ACOM or mm -hmm. school. So it does allow for certification and many um, many uh, acupuncturists in Maryland realize that and they say we want to be certified because we want to be able to have that in terms of being able to distinguish ourselves and also if we want to leave and go to other states, the reciprocity is important. 
to them to be able to do yeah, that. I don't mean to but pick on Maryland, but sure. I went to school in Maryland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's yeah. right, Maryland University right. of Integrative Health. Yes. And I mean, I live in Virginia, so yes. I drove to the school for three, three yes. and a half years. Mm -hmm. I don't want to drive there anymore because it was too much. I, I understand. So now I'm in Virginia. So what and I have my to home. Absolutely, but Justin, I, I've seen a trend in states contacting um, NCCM and saying, like state associations and the regulatory court in partnership, calling us and saying, we want to make sure that we're really um, having, uh, bringing in the standards that, that we that we deserve in order to be able to, for us to be integrated. So they come to us and we work with them. And I, I do want to address the herbal sort of, sort of because okay. a lot of people are confused about the herbs. And so you have acupuncturists that are, that are acupuncturists that don't practice herbs. And, and NCCM, exactly. And that's why we have a separate certification program for acupuncture. And that does not replace um, the, the, the certification in oral medicine. They're equal. We don't say one's better than the other. It depends on what the acupuncturist studied and what they want to choose. So states that do want to enact herbs, like for example, you have the state of Ohio, and I work with them for years to create a system so that they can recognize um, those uh, different ways of acupuncture and recognize different ways of oral medicine so that, so that the state actually tracks both. And that really works so that you, that you don't replace one with the other. So that is something that um, really we, we partner with states to do that because a lot of states do want to have that herbal training there but they don't want to replace it with those who want to practice acupuncture. So let's take a step back and let's look at it from the standpoint of someone who's preparing to take the exam. So yes. the students out there who are watching this. So someone's preparing to take the exams and they've gone through the years of schooling, they're ready, they've graduated, and I know I went through it myself. Yes. It's a stressful experience yes, to yes. just prepare yourself for the exam, not knowing what's going to be on it and whatnot. So what sort of resources does NCCOM offer to help sort of reduce that anxiety that may exist? That's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, there's a lot of information and a lot of resources on the NCCOM website. And I, this is one of the most important parts of this, this interview is for me to explain that to the applicants. And um, we have um, a, an NCSM exam prep center on our website um, where we have information about our examination content outlined. Each of our modules has a content outline that's developed by our subject matter experts. Uh, we, we just updated our content outline because of our last job analysis and we have a 2021 that's up there right now. Uh, we have study guides that um, explain the information about our examination. They have frequently asked questions. And then the best part of it is we have practice tests. A lot of people don't realize that NCSIM has official practice tests. Use them, they're helpful. Yes. I use them when, yes. when they came out. Exactly, and they're so official. They're, they're very they're, helpful. Right, there's a lot of companies and, and, and publications that say NCSIM practice tests, but they're not officially ours. These are the ones that where we have our former subject matter experts who worked on the exam helping to develop those. And we price them economically so we understand the students are on a budget. So we definitely encourage our students to really download this information and be able to utilize these resources. So let me go into a few questions sure. that came from some students. Here's one, it says, why isn't there a bigger emphasis on diet or say meditation, qigong, tai chi, in terms of certification process? Why is it just acupuncture, range of medicine, even body work is something that's sure. built in there? Sure. Well, well one of the, the educational requirements, it's important for our students to understand that the educational requirements taught at the schools are, are um, uh, created by ACOM, the Accreditation Commission for Acupuncture and Oral Medicine. ACOM is the accrediting um, organization or board that accredits each of the schools are recognized by the uh, Department of, of um, Education and U.S. Department of Education, and they're the ones that set the curriculum and the hours for the school. NCCM requires those hours as one of the prerequisites for certification. So those hours um, for um, you know, um, Asian body work, Trina, um, you know, East, East Asian um, diet, those are all set forth, those specific hours are set forth by ACOM. Now our exams are not dictated by ACOM or education. This is very important for everyone to understand. Our exams are created from what's being practiced out there in the profession. So we do what's called the job analysis. Sometimes people call it the occupational analysis, analysis every seven years, where we survey um, all of the practitioners out there, uh, certified, licensed, from all over, and we ask them specific questions about practice and demographic. We collect that information and then we use that information, our subject matter experts use that information to, um, to create 
the exams. That's the blueprint that we've used. So it's not that you sit down, break open a textbook, and pick a random chapter oh, and no. say, I want to ask this really challenging <laughs> question. No, no. I think that's the biggest misconception of the NCCOM. They have a lot of um, a lot of um, folks in the community don't understand how what a what a robust process and, and a laborious process it is to create those items. It, it's a lot, and we use we have such a matter of experts with a lot of training. And again, it's all about the blueprints of what's being practiced. That's why we update those exams every seven years. Because um, uh, we want to know what are people practicing, what are trends that we need to be able to include it's in the terms. because you're constantly analyzing the yes, market to see exactly. how it's changing yes. and changing the exam according to what people are looking for in right. the job market from an acupuncturist and also real life situations. Right, right. So going back to that question that, that the, the uh, student asked, um, the reason why the, the some of those areas that they would like to see more of, um, that has to do with the education curriculum they learned in schools. Our exams, if we feel like more people are doing trinal, more people are doing certain body works, then they'll, they'll, be, they'll actually be included in, in, the, in the exams according to the job analysis. So yes. let's go back to the process of taking the exam, but even after you're prepared for the exam or even for the licensing process, it can be a bit difficult to submit like some of the uh, documents that are necessary to apply mm -hmm. for board certification. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that the NCCOM offers like for guiding someone through this process? Because I remember going through it, not to say that you yeah. didn't offer anything then, I just, I was, you know, ignorant of the fact that I should probably look on the actual site and yes. I was examining. So what, what, what do you provide? Another excellent question. I'm very excited to announce that the application process, the one that you and others have experienced, has been completely, um, uh, ex uh, it, it's become very efficient and the time that an applicant would normally take, which was four to six weeks, mm -hmm. is now one week. How so? So, What's we, so about a year and a half ago, our staff started working with a new database management system in, okay. in, in the association world, it's called the AMS, Association Management System. And this vendor particularly works well with certification organizations like ours, and they customized their program to be able to create a completely paperless pro, um, uh, system. So no more sending in applications by mail, no more transfers, everything is now electronic. Even the schools have to comply. So schools have to do everything now through electronic. And they have. It took a while, but we've created a certain portal for them. Um, the CNT is now all basically electronic. We work with Council of Colleges for that. So by having everything um, go into the paperless environment, it's expedited that everything to the uh, point where everything's online. So so the, the applicant today can really streamline their process and go from waiting for weeks and weeks and weeks, yeah. and calls and calls and calls, to just sending an application within a week being approved. And that was one of the questions yes. that I had gotten yes. from somebody was, why does it take so long to be exactly. certified? And now this has changed. And I know recently I applied to be PDA provider. Oh, wonderful. And what I'm now on experience? board. I know it, it was really good because okay. I, it, at first it was daunting to hear mm -hmm. that I have to go through this like interview process yes. with, uh, I'm drawing a blank on her name. I'm Jennifer. Sorry. Jennifer, yes. yes. Jennifer, I'm sorry, I remember now. But I went through the process, it was a really nice conversation. Mm -hmm. She showed me the ins and outs of the system. Mm -hmm. But the really neat thing was to know that now, when I'm also becoming mm -hmm. recertified, mm -hmm. that it's gonna be so much easier. She's telling me with sending documents in, yes. and the school send them yes. in, or whoever the provider is can mm -hmm. send it in for you. So the bottom line, I think, is, is that the system is so much more efficient, at it least is. coming forward for that aspect, because mm -hmm. it's still being developed. But what you've stated is now that it takes much less time, so you can actually go do the work that you want to do. You can, you can, and, and I like to break the news right here with you is that our recertification system, which is the next program to unveil, is going to now, uh, we're, we're gonna create a system that's gonna be like a tracking system, like it is in Florida, where, like CE Broker, where you can, uh, like your provider, you actually can go in and, um, and, and, and track all your courses, and it's, it's become so much more expeditious. So that's coming up in the next couple of months, and we're very excited about that. One point I do want to make, Justin, um, for those applicants that are like ABA applicants or international applicants or special applicants, those will take a little bit longer because of, of the particular, so we always encourage you know, applicants if you're ABA or you know, if you're applying internationally or you have something um, like an ethical, you know, um, some, like a criminal background in your, in your past, 
you definitely want to answer those questions and you want to give more time to assist. The staff can really review that. All right, Mina, so two things I want to go into before I give you these questions that came from some other acupuncturists and other people out there that finished their survey. The first one is, can you speak a little bit about how California is different from the other states? Absolutely. So California is the only state that has its own examination requirement. Um, and and it, they have their own uh, educational requirements. Um, uh, so if one wants to live in California, you have to take the California Acupuncture License Exam called the CALI. And what I recommend that you do is you um, go to their website. We have information about the California Acupuncture Board on our website. And you can read about what are the requirements to be able to practice. They have more educational hours than some of the schools as well. So you really want to, they really want to understand that. Um, now, um, for those people that are in California that haven't taken the NCCS exams and they want to leave, um, I re we recommend also that you um, look at the state that you want to be in. So for example, Virginia, you do have to have the NCC certification. So what I always encourage um, California students to do is to take both. Take the California exam, of course, and then take the NCC exam so that you have that flexibility. Um, we've been in communication and, and uh, working with the California Acupuncture Board. Um, so um, they evaluated our exam several years ago um, to look at the equivalency of that. And because of our work there, we're really working with them to um, hopefully have, have it in the future so that um, there no, there's, the, the two requirements aren't there. I know that creates a hardship sometimes for students to have to take two exams. Yeah, it can, mm -hmm. uh, especially myself coming out of school and I yes. said, oh, I want to practice, but oh, I need to take the exam. Yes. And I mean, it takes time to prepare for the exam, it yes. takes time to take the exam, it takes time to work apply for certification, so right. it can take months and months and months for that process to yes, actually finalize. So it's a good idea to prepare in advance. So what she said is check out your state wherever you plan to practice, check out uh, all of their requirements, what it is that they need, and even if they don't have a board certification, I guarantee you it will help you along the way if suddenly you have to move or your spouse has another job in a different state and then all of a sudden you figure out that state requires the exam. Right. So it's a great idea to have this certification. I know personally it's helped me here in DC but also in Virginia where I practice in both of them. So yes. the other topic that I wanted to ask you about which has hit the news uh, pretty quickly yes. in the last several weeks mm -hmm. is Medicare. Yes. Acupuncturist, Medicare, back pain. This opens up an entire new world for us of clientele. So. Yes. You guys have spearheaded this uh, right. together, I, I assume right. with a bunch of other people. Yes, we worked so, very, yes. Ahead. So this was something that um, has been an, an initiative of us, as well as other organizations. ASA mm -hmm. has been very involved in it. ASA is American Society for Acupuncturists. They've been doing some great work on that, as well as us uh, since um, SAR, Society for Acupuncture Research, has submitted information, and other groups have submitted information. So. Um, one of the things that we did uh, uh, about a year ago, we started submitting comments uh, regarding lower back pain because uh, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, was looking at adding back pain for um, um, uh, for seniors uh, yeah. for acupuncture. So one of the most common reasons, right? Which was which was a big deal for us, and we knew this would be an opportunity for us to get acupuncture into Medicare at least to start to. So we started submitting information, and then lo and behold. Um, we got the news um, about a month ago that it's been uh, uh, that, that, that acupuncture is now covered for back pain, and we weren't expecting it to happen this quickly. We wanted to study it. We thought it would take at least a couple of years. In fact, um, we had met with some folks within the NIH that said it's going to take a while, but it just it was a good opportunity. Uh, HHS looked at it and they said we want this to happen. I'm sure the demand from seniors also played a lot. Yeah, where does that place us now in the process? Can we just immediately start treating people that are covered by Medicare? What can there's we do? There's some works that we still need to do. There's um, there's issues such as supervision because when you read the information, and it's on our website, we actually did a joint letter with ASA where we sent some information to all of the acupuncture community about it. So there's supervision we have to look at. There's reimbursement. We want to really look, try to work with the reimbursement so that we're reimbursed at a, at a decent level. Um, and then there's access. So there's a lot of information that we still have to, to work on and that requires a congressional act or a congressional bill. So one of the things we're doing and we're working with ASA on that is we're actually going to be um, meeting with congressional sponsors so that we can uh, create a bill. We have to actually we have to open up the Social Security Act so that we can have licensed acupuncturists 
included, not just, you know, we want to be very distinctive about our qualifications and education. Yeah. And you saw on the CMS that licensed acupuncturists. What was the required. terminology they used? There was a. They, there was a. There was a. Uh, the, the the requirement for supervision was there, and one of the reasons uh, they used auxiliary personnel. Auxiliary personnel. Yes. That's what it was. Right. Yes. And the reason why, what CMS uh, when we had conversations with them, they said the supervision has to be there because we're most of us are not yet in the payer system. Acupuncturists are not yet in the payer system. So because of that, they, we have to have the supervision. But we still, we, we feel that we can still talk to, um, uh, through Congress, we can really work on that. We don't have to have either remove supervision or don't have to have direct supervision. So when they say supervision, does that mean I have to contact a doctor's office and they get consent to work out of their office to treat their patients, or can they refer to me to my clinic? That's what we have to define. So, um, so it's so, not defined at this right. point. Uh, the, the good news is the word direct was not included. Direct supervision would have been very problematic and that would have really closed up access for many licensed acupuncturists. But we really need to uh, get that defined and, and we need to work with um, uh, members of Congress who support us. Um, this is very important because this is going to lay down the, the rules and regulations that we work. So um, I've already been contacted by many acupuncturists who are wanting to start treating. They're ready to go. Um, uh, people have questions about opting in and whatnot and, and about reimbursement. So we're, uh, what we're gonna do is this ASA uh, and NCCOM, and we're gonna start putting together more and more information as we're working with Congress, um, getting a bill going, getting um, um, you know, um, traction on the bill. ASA is having a conference coming up in May. We're gonna try to do a fly-in, really get support for something so that we can bring so awareness. So those are the next steps, essentially. Yes. I mean, we could be ready, we could already be thinking about how we want to market to this uh, clientele, right. uh, start contacting some locations, say this is new, yes. it's not gonna be on the menu, right. and the next thing that we should look out for is? The next thing we should look out for is the bill, support the bill. bill. And which is why it's imperative that the members of the uh, acupuncture community just we work together and not have this, but Excellent. we really want to put our support behind a, a bill and hopefully we'll have the Senate and a member of the House of Representatives support it, and a bill that can really um, uh, cover some of the areas that we talked about so that we can go ahead and, and um, um, have it defined in the Social Security Act. So here's something that maybe anybody can do, student or acupuncturist. Mm -hmm. What could we do in terms of reaching out to our representatives? Mm -hmm. Who should we look towards to contact with, aside from just supporting right. the organization here? Advocacy is very important, and I think that um, Applicant, uh, students or diplomates should always know their local legislators, not just their state legislators, but their also U.S. Congress rep uh, rep rep representatives. Every one of these members have a field office, so I would always put your best, you know, uh, garb on and grab information about who you are, introduce yourself. Right. It's nice to have an ask, an ask is when you go in for a particular reason. But sometimes it's also okay to go and say hello. Uh, typically you have staffers there. Now people are always looking to talk to the member, but most of the times the staffers, and the staffers are the ones that really make, do a lot of the work. So you wanna introduce yourself, get to know them, quit, become an expert to them in the fields of acupuncture. So when there's something going on, they will contact you. It's important for the grassroots to happen, and then when there's an issue like the support of a congressional bill or support of a state bill, they'll know who you are. Yeah, and this is, I mean, the profession has come this far, yes. not because it just magically happened, but yes. because people took action. Absolutely. Talked to people and made things happen. So, right. and there's a lot of questions asked, which is where we're going to talk about some questions now. Sure. So here are some questions about the actual exam. Let's backtrack a little bit to the board exams. And there, is, there seems to be some concern about the cost of the exams. Mm -hmm. uh, and myself included, you come out of school, you have a little bit of debt. Mm -hmm. Okay, some student loans maybe to pay off. Yeah. And then you realize you have to take all these exams and there's a price tag on it. So can you speak a little bit about that? Yes. So um, this is a complaint I often hear. The NCC exams are expensive and why they're so expensive. So I want to take the time to explain just the, the cost associated with developing the NCC exams. Uh, not, there's a lot of components to creating it and it's, a, as I mentioned before, it's an expensive, laborious process. So we have to bring in several outside um, vendors to help us. We have to bring in what's called a psychometrician, which is, um, we, we use um, currently um, shorter measurement technologies with Protect, two groups that really understand the validity and reliability of the items. So they have to come in and work with us. 
Then we also have um, our subject matter experts, which are um, practitioners you know, throughout the country that we bring in and train um, and so that they can understand the process of becoming a uh, subject matter expert on our exam development committee. So every one of those exams I mentioned earlier in the interview has an exam development committee. And wow. there's a whole process for that. And we meet regularly, we have face-to-face -face meetings, we have um, meetings where a, a group of uh, other um, experts write items for the exam, and they have to review those items, make sure that the items are um, according to the criteria that's, that's for a valid, reliable exam. Mm -hmm. Then the psychometrics, the psychometrics get involved and look at the validity and reliability. Then it goes back again, it's a lot of work. In addition, um, we are actually, um, a lot of people don't know this about NCCM2, but we are accredited by the National um, uh, Commission for Certifying Agencies, NCCA. They create very strict guidelines on the development of our exams, and we have to follow it to a T. They have standards, and you can go on our website and look at NCC standards. So the development of these exams mm -hmm. is not just like I mentioned earlier. You break out a textbook, you have five people sitting around the table <laughs> say, this is a great topic, let's ask them all these things. No, guys, it's, so. it's very, very, it's a rigorous, robust process. I mean, here's another question about the actual questions themselves, the exam. So when questions are developed, how, I mean, we talked about how they're created and decided upon in terms of it's uh, uh, based off of the job market analysis, et cetera. So can you talk a little bit about how these questions do come up with and the people that are involved in the process? So all of the subject matter experts that um, um, devote their time to developing the items are volunteers. Um, some of them are educators in schools, um, some are practitioners, they're all NCSIM certified, of course, because they have access. And they work together along with our professional staff and psychometricians um, to develop the exam. So um, again, they use, they use um, the, the references, we have references that are listed on our website to develop exams, but most importantly, they use our content outline, which again goes back to the job analysis. Yeah, the so, content, this right. is the one that people that yes. you develop for right. the exams. And That's the blueprint so, of the exam. Right. So as I mentioned, five to seven years ago, we have we have a, a group of subject matter experts uh, and members of the profession that volunteer to come up with a job analysis panel to create those content. And then we have different exam committee groups meet to create the actual items. And this is an ongoing process. This isn't like, okay, we have the exams, there you go. We have adaptive exams, which means that we have to have a rich item bank, and, and the exams change. Yeah, and I remember that, and that's yes. as, as you take the test, because yes. I looked that up and I thought, oh, maybe the questions are going to be the same, so I no. could go and interview some people before I take the exam, but then I realized adaptive means that so, it's going to change based on right. how I perform. So exactly, so you and I can be sitting next to each other at an uh, NCSIM or a Pearson Duke Test Center, you will get different items than I will. Let's say you're, you're more prepared than I'm less prepared, so you will, you, the items will get more difficult to be able to test your knowledge, skills, and abilities. The knowledge, skills, and abilities are an important part of what, how we create and de uh, develop our exams. So all of this, all of this work, it's year-round work, it's non-stop work, is what constitutes the, the, um, the, the price for the exams. As well as we work with Pearson View, which is the, the Pearson View is one of the best um, administrating exam um, uh, vendors out there. So when you go to our Pearson View Center, the security uh, is, yes. yeah, you, you know, you know, it's very difficult. <laughs> three times you don't have for all three exams, or for, for the, the right. exams. I can tell you, Justin, when I first started, right, blood tests. everything, you, <laughs> no. give, give your, you have to sign it. Well, when I first started the NCCOM, we used to actually have pencil and paper exams, and cheating was, we would have regular cheating. Since we moved over to adaptive, we hardly have cases of cheating going on. Right. I can imagine, yeah, because I remember the environment. Very strict, yeah. and, and, and for, for good reasons, of course. Right. Like recording you while right. you're taking the process or taking the test. So I have a question of, uh, again about the questions themselves. So when you're taking the test, I remember 100 questions for each exam. You don't know if you get it right. You only wait until the very end and you see pass or you don't know. whatever. I don't know right. what the other one is. Yes. I did, did not. You pass. did not. Yes. I passed you all passed. of my, obviously. <laughs> yes. But if you don't pass or if you do pass, you just get that little note at the end and then you take it to the front. So you don't know which questions you missed or if your knowledge is well, up or not. How, how can we evaluate if, that? If you fail, um, you get a document sent 
sent back to you mailed within about a month. And that, first of all, that's where you get confirmed you actually failed. Okay. And then that's where it actually shows the domain area was where you failed. Oh, okay. And that's it's a good right, thing I didn't get right. that. You didn't get that. That's why you didn't experience that. But now those, I know why it's been Right. So for those for those students that take it and they fail, and, and I know it's 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 difficult to go through, but what I encourage them to do is to look at those particular areas where they failed and go back as the content outlines and really study those areas. So we do give you a report. And there's a, a brief for myself. When I prepare for these tests, I downloaded the course outlines that are available on yes. the NCU website and I got every single textbook that was on the list. <laughs> yes. And I went through every single topic in great yes. detail and I studied, I won't tell you how long I studied for the exam, but it was a long time. And it was worthwhile. And you passed. And I passed, yes. yeah. So everything that they're producing for you will help you to get right. through the exam. Right. It's not there to be this laborious process that's like really stressful. Any test you take is stressful, even the quizzes that I give my students. It, it, it so. is stressful, and that's why we, we, we the application period is a four-year period, and we, encur we encourage our um, students to really take the time to study. I mean, you could technically take all the exams in one week. I would not suggest that. You yes. want to spread well, it out. <laughs> You want to spread it out, but if you do fail, you you have to wait 45 days. Yes. Because we, we right. do that on purpose. We want you to just go back and really yeah. assess. And you can only take right. it a certain number of times, am I right? Yeah, currently it's five times. Five times? Yes. Okay, so here's another question for you. Um, why isn't there an oral exam like they have in different forms of medicine where you sit down in front of a board right. or a group of people and they mm -hmm. ask you questions to interpret your level of knowledge? Uh, yes, so we act, we actually used to have the NCSIM many, many years ago, and some of our veteran practitioners probably remember this, we used to have a clinical exam, which was similar to what some of the Western medicine components have, where people would have to go into a room and there would be a person there, and you'd have to actually deal with them. So that was a clinical portion. Okay. Um, we ended up, NCSIM actually stopped doing that because we found that the process was really not consistent because one person would get a different subject matter that was obese and one would get a very muscular. So there was a lot of complaint about the consistency. And, and every the, school teaches yes, a little differently exactly. too, which makes it harder. And the psychometricians we were student. working with said this is not really valid and reliable. So we, got, we, we did away with the clinical portion. And the oral, in terms of having an oral exam, is very difficult to administer. Um, so if you were to actually bring on um, different readers, you, and, and it would be difficult because some people have accents, some people don't understand the terminology, you'd have to be people that are actually practitioners that can really, particularly when you're dealing with herbs. So we've tried looking at different models and found that this is the best. The point location exam is the closest thing to the clinical because when you're taking the point location, we try to really recoup those images regularly, um, that's when you could actually distinguish, distinguish the points to the computer after the exam. Right, very good. So. Uh, let me ask you a couple questions on the topic of dry needling. Yes. So this is something, uh, all, all of these questions are essentially coming from acupuncturists or students now. Sure. And the question is, instead of sort of having this battle, which a lot of people are seeing now between acupuncture and dry needling, uh, someone asks, why don't we get on board with the practice ourselves and start offering better services than physical therapists, like offering, say, a trigger point classes or something along this line? Well, this is something that I know some providers are already doing. I know some providers have uh, already contacted me and they want to be able to offer dry needling courses to acupuncturists. Um, and NCCOM, um, if you are a provider and you're an acupuncturist and you want to offer um, uh, a dry needling course for acupuncturists, you, you know, they can be a provider. If you're a physical therapist wanting to offer it for physical, you know, obviously we will not approve it. So. Um, that's already happening. Um, I know some, and, the, and I, I, I think there might be some schools that actually have that, but that's something that really needs to be brought up with um, the schools and ACOM to put dry needling into, like, put it, actually have more information um, for dry needling incorporated into the educational programs. But particularly for postgraduate work, I know several acupuncturists have actually gone ahead and taken dry needling courses themselves. Um, there's also, I know there's been a lot of talk about, oh, well, we should be developing that or something. But again, we want to work with education and providers and those people who actually. Yeah, and my it. viewpoint yes. on the topic, first of all, this is a question that comes from somebody sure. else, but my viewpoint is that we should learn about it. We should. We should actually study dry needling rather than force them to study acupuncture. I we agree. should both on equal, on equal sides mm -hmm. try to learn a little bit about the forms of medicine. So rather than battle, let's try to find some common ground we, and work together. Uh, 
Justin, that's something that could be echoed through a lot of the state associations. Um, I, I really encourage um, the acupuncturists and students to contact their state associations. A lot of them are already looking into that. They want to start working with, um, be more collaborative rather than fighting because they really, really realize we have to. Yeah. We, we believe that 25, 30 hours is not work for physical therapy to be able to practice. No. That is, um, uh, as I always mention, um, acupuncture is our medicine, it's not a modality. So we really want to encourage that, but there is room for to be able to have conversations for collaboration. And many state associations are moving towards that direction. That's right. Mm -hmm. So here's another question. Uh, in relation to the NCTOM and medical doctors, so the question was, why is an NCTOM working to enforce credentials for medical doctors and other Western medicine practitioners using these techniques like dry needling? So, well, the medical doctors have their own certification program, actually, or certificate program, I should say. The AAMMA actually has a, the AAMMA has a has a, um, a board that actually has a 300-hour uh, program, I believe, that that is for um, acupuncturists that are medical doctors. So they already have it. The chiropractors already have their own too. So whether that's you know insufficient hours or not, that's there. And a lot of the state regulatory boards to say, okay, you have your hours. That's what we're the physical therapists do not. They don't have any type of um, set hours or any type of set boards or anything like that. And that's definitely an issue. And now you have the nurses that are trying to do this as well in Washington State and some of the other states. That's definitely yeah. a problem. So, in, so the question was, why should NCCM do this? Well, this is something that really the profession needs to address. And, and if someone is interested in, in, in working with us and creating the assessment, because we are an examination certification board, we're not an educational board, or we don't create curriculum, that would be a partnership we would do, like let's say with you know a school or with um, ASA or another organization, we wouldn't develop the whole thing. But it's something that the profession would come to and talk to us about. Um, I definitely think there needs to be standards for physical therapists, currently there aren't, um, but some of the other professions like the MDs and the chiropractors have already established it. Now, um, I certainly think that there, you know, th th this is something that I think the profession um, really needs to look at in terms of um, other, um, like you've got athletic trainers now. Right, there's a lot got of other, that are we have to really be looking at that. And, using and, recommended. Right, yeah. and this is something that's really, um, uh, it is a threat. Um, but at the same time, there's going to be like with Medicare, there's going to be 80 million seniors that are going to be wanting acupuncture. Okay, right. that's huge. That's yeah. many, many, many practitioners. So what we need to do is be collaborative and say, okay, you guys want to practice, you know, dry needling, then this is what you need. And you need to refer to us when you get out of the scope of what you're supposed to practice. We're gonna, we're gonna need a lot of people to I practice. I think there's that. room for opportunity also as mm -hmm. well in terms of helping to educate the other side of the river, if you wanted to call it that. So right. medical doctors, PTs, chiropractors, to right. give them information as to why the methods behind the, the application of acupuncture, the theories, et cetera, make sense right. in applying it in a specific way as right. opposed to just shoving needles in. So Absolutely. rather than the battle, again, you said trying right. to find a way to be collaborative, and this is right. the future of medicine. It's all this is, in, in, this, uh, integrated. It's all this, working together. This is the future of medicine. This is what's happening right now is that the medicine works. Consumer growth of acupuncture is more and more. So others want to come in and practice, but they have to be state, they have to first of all be knowledgeable and have the experience and safe to be able to practice. And and since we're the experts, this is our medicine, we have to be able to work with them so that we can say this is your scope, this is what you can do, and we need to refer. So those are some of the conversations we need to have. I know some states are already doing that and some organizations are already doing that. So we always welcome collaboration. So that actually ends the questioning, but I want to give you the opportunity to say one more thing. Could you provide some words of encouragement out there for the students who are ready to enter the profession, who are ready to take the exam, they're nearing graduation, they're ready to become acupuncturists officially, they're board certified? Give them a few words of encouragement. Well, we at the NCCM are very excited that you are studying this wonderful medicine. We want to support you in every way that we can. We have an excellent staff here in Washington, D.C. that's ready to take the calls help you we have even more enhanced customer service tools to help you so that you can have your questions answered we definitely want you to be prepared to take these exams and so we def um, encourage you to go to our website become familiar with the examinations um, if you have questions contact us we have many resources available we want you to work with the state licensing board as well because we work in partnership with them 
And what's really exciting for me is that in my conversations with students, um, they want to go out there and work in hospitals. They want to be integrated. They want to be part of the healthcare system. They want to be part of the solu solution of the healthcare um, issues and crises that we have. So um, we welcome them and we encourage them. That's right. Thank you all for tuning in to the Ask the Expert show. This is part two, and I'm really pleased to be here with you again, Mina. Uh, it's just been a wonderful opportunity. I'm glad that we could share a little bit more on the inside of the organization and the fact that you guys are so open. I mean, this has been amazing. The, Thank that you've you. been so open speaks volumes to the organization, but also to how open they are to the viewers out there. So if you want to know more about the exams, more about the NCCUM process, anything that they offer, being an acupuncturist, being a student, whatever level you are on, uh, what, whatever uh, place you are in terms of your education or your profession, building your career, they're here for you. So thank you, Mina, thank you, very much. Thank you for having and me here. I look forward to our next time. Thank you so much. Okay.